All right, hi everyone. Jared Napolitano here, a marketing advocate for the Star Wars CCG Players Committee. I'm with me tonight. I have a special guest, John Carr. Say hi to everyone, John. Hello, everybody. <laughs> we are going to be doing a uh, episode one in a new series that we wanted to roll out for this year. I'll call it a retro spotlight series. Um, as I was telling John initially about this, it doesn't necessarily have to be someone who's exclusively a retro player or someone who <laughs> is coming off of a uh, an event win in the retro league or the online uh, retro event, but you know, kind of a, a couple different factors. And, and and John definitely kind of fit the bill of someone who I was interested in learning about his story um, and how we got here. And one of the cool things that we'll talk about too is John is registered for the U.S. Nationals um, in a couple weeks. And I think you said that's going to be your first foray into open play, basically. Yeah, yeah I've, I've never played a single game of open. So oh, boy. <laughs> it'll be an experience. Yeah. Yeah, well, the good thing is that there will be um, an event on. Yeah, are you going to do the cube or the retro event? Probably the retro? Uh, retro event, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, then there'll be uh, plenty of. And, and, and honestly, like, the majors are so much fun that even if you have honestly never played open, it's still a lot of fun. Lots of good people to meet and lots of good stuff to do. Um, before and after the actual actual events. Yeah, that's that's mainly what I'm I'm looking for that experience to be not to win U.S. Nationals, but yeah. <laughs> just to meet the people that you know I've voyeured, like listening to podcasts or watching mm -hmm. YouTube videos and just meeting some of these folks, um, some yeah. of the, the greatest that have ever played the game that'll be there. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to that. Yeah, good stuff. Good stuff. Um, so, so we'll jump in here. I have kind of like the agenda or the rundown is what I call it, um, hear about John's story and hear about, you know, the recent, um, event one, we'll talk a little bit about the upcoming events in the retro league. And then, um, you may talk a little bit about open or not open the, uh, the nationals event, perhaps a little bit more, um, at the tail end. So thanks everyone for joining. Thanks everyone for watching this on replay. Uh, hopefully you find it interesting and, um, you know, I'm sure you'll see me and, and John on, on jump and, uh, perhaps in person. Um, all right, so let's get started, John. So let's hear about your background, first exposure to the game, um, you know, who you played with, did you play competitively, and we'll I kind of have this bullet just for structure, but we can see see how the conversation goes. So, so how did you start? Yep, so certainly. So I actually started back in 95. Uh, my girlfriend in college at the time got me two starter decks for Christmas. I had never heard of the game, knew nothing about it. Uh, she got them for me for Christmas, a couple booster packs. I remember getting a Grand Moff Tarkin and a Princess Leia in those nice. those two. Um, and, you know, from there, had some college roommates um, introduce them to the game. So basically, when I first started, it was just, just casual, mm -hmm. getting my roommates to play. Um, and eventually, I met a, a friend uh, at college and... You know, we started meeting up regularly and we would mm -hmm. just, you know, play against each other. Mm -hmm. And that grew into some local tournaments. Um, so I went to, to school uh, at University of Florida. Okay. So I just played. Gators. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So just played locally. Um, some various tournaments in Gainesville. Okay. There was a, a local, very small bookstore that hosted events like every Friday night. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'd play there. Um, did surprisingly okay in some of those initial local tournaments. So mm -hmm. I won two, uh, Boba, or not Boba Fett, but Jabba the Hutt t-shirts. Oh, nice. So have those still to these, this day, um, as kind of a, a trophy from, from that time. Mm -hmm. Um, after college, I moved down to South Florida and played just a little bit. Um, so this was 99. I moved down to to South Florida, played in a couple of tournaments down in Miami, mm. um, sometime between 99 and 2001 when I, I stopped playing. Um, the highlights that I remember from, from that period was, um, there was a Florida player named David Irvine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I that's know. what I was going to ask. That's the one top name that came to mind. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know if anyone knows of him, but I remember playing against him in, in back-to-back -back tournaments. The first time he, he beat me mm -hmm. and it was like the finals and I'm like, ah, darn it. I knew he was a good player. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next tournament, which actually ended up being the last tournament I ever played, uh, I got to play him again in the finals and I beat him wow. and I won a Luke Skywalker, Jedi Knight foil and a nice. um, Japanese, uh, Ozzel, which I didn't know would go on to be worth yeah. so much money, but, yeah. um, 
you know, those were those were some some good times. Um, I kind of got out of the game right there when the episode one sets came out. Mm-hmm. So I might have bought one or two booster packs of Tatooine, and from there, that was it. I mm-hmm. I was pretty much out of the game. Didn't buy Coruscant or or mm-hmm. Thief Palace, and I was literally out of the game for twenty years from wow. two thousand one until two thousand twenty one. Wow. Um, all right, let me pause Did you there. Get... Let me let me pause. All right, so, okay. all right, yeah. So David Irvine, I'm pretty sure he was one of the highest, one or two, maybe three highest players in the Dagobah region because I remember seeing him on the ratings. So that's pretty yeah. cool that you and you beat him. So that would have been like the Death Star Two era. Yeah, Death Star okay, Two. So like, no, that was late 2000. That was the last time that I played Death Star Two. Okay. Cool. And then were you kind of just like steadily, you know, playing with your friends like 97, 98, 99, and then you started going right. to more events once you moved to South Florida. Correct. Yeah. So in the 95 through 99 was almost exclusively just one buddy that I had at, at, mm. at UF. Um, his name was Gerald. So shout out to Gerald. <laughs> um, uh, one funny thing about that, uh, I was reconnecting with him on Facebook a few weeks ago, and he, he still remembers our, our playing days back mm. then. He also remembers that I, I um donated plasma just to be able to buy star wars cards oh wow uh, you know I was a struggling <laughs> poor college student so wow. i had to do something so he, he, re- he remembered that it's kind of funny so yeah, that's a good story yeah yeah, yeah it's pretty crazy because yeah at the time you know pretty much everyone hooked on were you know ranging from 10 years old to probably like 25 kind of the prime um yeah. when when people got pulled into this game and obviously not a lot of people were super rich and that game wasn't cheap and especially if you're trying to find like darth vader's and obi-wan kenobi's and that type Absolutely. of thing and then it got apparently super cheap in like early 2000s and now it's now it's like super expensive mm-hmm. again which yes thank god for yeah. gimp um for sure okay all right so that's cool all right so yeah um yeah so then the episode one stuff tatooine Coruscant, that was kind of in your blind spot and then you came yeah. back um, so a 20-year hiatus, any, like, check-ins or pretty much just, like, straight up like a dark period almost to the to the game? Pretty much a complete blackout. Um, mm. I mean, I would follow news events. So, like, the um, the teacher that uh, used Star Wars cards to teach his, his students, mm-hmm. like, I was aware of things like that. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't aware yeah, of what Mark was going Walseth, on yeah. in the game. Yeah. Did you keep all your cards? Or just sell yeah, them I, I, no, nice. I kept all my cards, thankfully. Uh, nice. And honestly, that's kind of, you know, maybe leading on to the next question. But what got me back into the game was it was 2021 during the pandemic. And, you know, I just wanted to complete my collection. So I had mm-hmm. I didn't have every card from every set. Um, so I wanted to, to remedy that. Um, mm-hmm. I still don't have all I don't I don't have Coruscant or Thief Palace, but I have every card outside of those two sets. Nice. Uh, so. A uh, funny story there. Um, I remember buying a bunch of cards from from Brian Fred and some of his auctions on eBay, mm-hmm. and I bought a I think it was, it was a Hoth set, and he actually shipped me the wrong the wrong one. He sent me a, a New Hope, <laughs> uh, or or whatever. So he uh, was very accommodating. Uh, mm-hmm. Shipped me the right one. I shipped him the the wrong one back, and mm-hmm. he uh, sent me a a uh, unopened booster pack of Premier Limited, mm-hmm. and of course, once he did that, I had to collect all the different, you know, unopened packs. Oh, okay. so, oh nice. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> yeah, B Fred's awesome, and you'll you'll he goes to pretty much every single major. Um, I don't think he's pre-registered for nationals, but he also didn't pre-register for um, uh, San Diego, and he went. He has a he has a lot of people that give him kind of the the prizes. So, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so no, he, he's awesome. I'll be that'll be cool for you meeting him in person. Um, yeah. Okay, so you got back in, so from a collecting angle, um, 2021, and then what brought, you, how did you learn about GIMP, or, and how did you first start playing on there? I, honestly, I don't remember what, what, how I learned about GIMP, oh. um, probably doing, you know, just various searches um, mm-hmm. on the internet about, about the game, um, and then when I saw it, it was just like the greatest thing ever, right? I mean, yeah. you can play it from anywhere was the middle of the pandemic so we weren't going out doing things mm-hmm. so it was a little intimidating at first because i didn't want to be that guy that that you know joins a game and then you know i'm taking my time i don't understand what's happening i, I don't mm-hmm. understand the controls or whatever so i took it very cautiously and and maybe too much but um when the 2022 retro event was announced 
or I, I joined about halfway through. So, um, mm -hmm. when yeah, the when league, right? That, what's that? The league, you mean the, the five event oh, the series? League, yeah, the yeah. retro league. Yes, mm -hmm. sorry. No, no problem. Uh, when, so it's like I, middle of 2022. Okay. Yeah. When I saw that, um, I, I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna just gonna jump in, see what happens. Um, mm -hmm. It's a retro, so it's I know the cards. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't I didn't have to learn all the open cards and defensive mm -hmm. shields and all those other things that I had mm -hmm. never played with. So I was like, all right, this is the perfect way for me to to jump in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I had zero expectations for that that first event. Mm -hmm. my goal was to win one game <laughs> if I would win one game I'd be happy yeah. and I ended up going three and three that first mm -hmm. event I'm like all right this is good and it, I enjoyed it it was a lot of fun uh did the next event which I think was the fourth one still yeah. went three and three in that one mm -hmm. uh, but I was learning so things that I remember is you know I was just trying to to one learn how to use cam and two you know try to understand what are the good decks and Mm -hmm. what are some counters and whatever so i was doing crazy things just you know hidden base numbers trying to you know get some mm -hmm. cheap wins and i i think i had one cheap win that way and but it <laughs> wasn't sustainable i didn't think it was like the, the people that were playing were good mm -hmm. and i needed to actually get better instead of just trying to get lucky mm -hmm. and so that's when i kind of took a different approach and tried to focus on you know one dark side deck one light side deck and kind of learn those. Oh, and would you play them online in like casual tables or like the, the leagues yeah, on jump? Exactly. So I played them casually. Um, they were actually the last decks that I played in person back in, <laughs> you know, awesome. the, the cypher days. So it was a hidden base <laughs> deck and a hunt down deck. So I had familiarity with them, uh, definitely helped. Um, and then that's what I played in the, the last, uh, event of the 2022 retro league. And which was the mirror reflections it. too, right? Right. Yep. And so I avoided uh, watch your step with my dark side <laughs> deck until the finals. Uh -huh. So that that was fortunate for me. But yeah. um, you know, I, I was you know blown away that I made it to the finals of that event, mm -hmm. um, and I lost to Co. Yes, that's Andrew. Yeah, CoTVG. Andrew, yes. And you might not have known this at the time, but he top aided the 2021 online retro event, the Premier to Death Star oh. Two one. Um, and he's apparently a part of the team, the, the retro team with uh, Kevin Bing, uh, Dark Deal 44. Um, so yeah, I think you guys were both five and zero going into that final game. Yes, yeah. yeah. And he was playing Watcher Step <laughs> against my uh, Hunt Down deck, and it wasn't even close. Like it's a little embarrassing that I, I didn't put up a better effort. But no, nah, it's a tough. It I a think it's a tough fun. matchup. And Watcher Step's yeah. so strong in that format, which is why this year we're <laughs> we're banning black sun and watch your steps so that'll be yeah. interesting to see kind of how that meta shakes out um yeah i was happy to see that that change mm -hmm. for for this year so mm -hmm. we'll see yeah that that's really cool that you know your last in-person event that you went to way back you know was premiered a death star 2 format and yep. now uh you know kind of picked that back up middle of last year um yeah i think it was like june july time frame i want to say um but yeah, that's cool. So, yeah, Jemp is awesome because you just, I go back and forth between Jemp or Gimp. Um, yeah, you just kind of see your, your growth and you just get so many reps. And when you're first starting, I always say like, the first, each game you're learning like five, six different things when you're first getting, you know, either back used to the game, learning the game for the first time or getting reassimilated yeah. to the game. And then, you know, as you play more and more, you, you might learn maybe one or two things each game, that type of thing. Um, but it, it's so cool that we can play anyone, anywhere, <laughs> with any cards at any time of the day, basically. It's a it's a magnificent uh, invention, and shout out to Troy and uh, for the creator and uh, for creating it, and then for Adam Fletcher and Jeremy DiPaolo, who are kind of the main overseers of it of it right now. But um, yeah, I mean, the other thing that I, I really like about it is the the replay. You can mm -hmm. rewatch your your game, so that helped me tremendously. So, I mean, after every every game, I would rewatch it and and learn what you know kind of misplays I did or mm -hmm. kind of. The turning point of each did. game yeah 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 definitely so th th i think that is a a great thing to do um, to help you improve is just to rewatch your game and, mm -hmm. and see how you could have done things differently 
Yeah, one thing that I see, just tips tips to people out there, and now I feel like this comes to mind as I review games either live or as I'm playing games or as I review games or, or replay games. There's like, may, maybe, definitely more so in open, a little less so in retro, but still to a point. There's like this build up, this setup, and then you get to the one turn that's maybe like turn five, six, seven, eight, something like that in that range. You're like, this is a big turn. This is the turn where the big battle is going to happen. Do you have the counters you need? Who's going to come out of the battle? And then you can just tell it's it's often like the pivotal point. And then usually you look back and you say, oh, I should have done this or I should have waited a turn. Or, um, And I think gradually as, as people just play play more and more, they, they kind of can identify that and they know kind of, okay, here's the key decision. And then determining whether to take kind of a calculated risk or to be a little conservative, um, yeah. live for another turn, that type of thing. Um, but yeah, now the replay function is awesome. And, I'm always kind of, I'm not amazed because, I, I mean, a lot of GIMP I think is pretty intuitive, but then sometimes you're like, some people are like, well, how do I get my replays? And it's like, like you know, that tab at the top, the game history. And yeah, it's a, it's a really, really good feature um, for it. Um, okay, so then, yeah, so you finished five and one in the uh, event five and then kind of the off season, <laughs> I'll say, because I think we wrapped up maybe like October-ish. And then I think we announced that we we're going to do the league again. We did a survey that started getting kicked up like end of December, early January. And then just kind of what was, what was your thinking, kind of your feelings for the 2023 league as that started? Right, so for 2023 league, um, what I did to kind of prepare, the first event was premiere through uh, Hoth, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I knew very little about the format. So I tried to look online for old deck lists. I found mm-hmm. a some images of an old scry magazine, I think it was, <laughs> that had some some deck lists yeah. in there. Yeah. And so I I tried those, um, wasn't very successful with them. So I, I tried a whole bunch of things in that like December, early January time frame. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried like for light side, the, the EBO deck and I, it wasn't my style of deck and mm-hmm. I, I didn't play it right. So I had no luck with that. I tried like an all space deck and mm-hmm. didn't have any luck with that. Um, but I, I tried a dark side deck that was very, very balanced. So it had like a lot of an equal amount of space, equal amount of um, lizard walkers mm-hmm. and equal amount of characters. And mm-hmm. I did well with that because I could adjust um, based on, you know, what cards I was drawing or mm-hmm. what they were playing, what the opponent was playing. Yeah. And it was more my style. So I set out to build a light side deck that was you know, almost a mirror of my dark side balance deck. Mm-hmm. So it was pretty much th- the same deck, just, mm-hmm. you know, the different side. And I had luck with it. And so that's what I ran with throughout the, the first league. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess we'll get into that later. But yeah. so that my approach was just preparing for that this first event. So I haven't done any real preparation for, for the mm-hmm. other events. Um, so, you know, my expectations are, are not not super high but you know i'm gonna obviously give it my best but, yeah. Um, yeah so a few things so one of the funny things when i look at like the retro formats and like we upload like the videos on the youtube and usually usually for open formats we put like the deck archetype like the objective that was played <laughs> and then like in these early formats like premiere to new hope premiere to hoth it's just kind of like light versus dark <laughs> like you know there's I, I guess to you, what you're saying there, like sometimes you might have a, like a space heavy deck versus a ground heavy deck, but it, it's kind of, I think in that era, it was like play the good cards basically. And then maybe have like 10, 12 cards are kind of like, you know, the, 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 the tricky stuff. Like, are you playing limited resources? How many monarchs are you playing? What's your sense alter package? Right. Like, um, but pretty much every deck's got, you know, three, four Obi-Wans and every dark deck's got four or five Vaders. And, and that's, what's really cool about jump is that, you know, people don't have to worry. Like back then, I mean, how many people had four or five Vaders, Obi-Wans, um, like, you know, it was much more scarce to do that. And now you can play seven Darth Vaders in your deck if you want and, and not worry about it. Um, so, so yeah, so you went with the balance. Um, I wasn't going to say, um, but yeah, all right. So let's go through, I mean, your, your schedule, was not easy. You you started off with Party McFly. Who, I know Alex is pretty good with uh, retro formats. Then you played Gary, who's our uh, our resident um, Kiwi from from New Zealand. And yeah. then you played Will, who beat me in game one, who might actually be in the chat now. But so you defeated him. I know he's he's pretty sharp with retro formats. And then you kind of went through a gauntlet, to be honest. Um, your final three: Timo, who's who's probably the most active player on Gem. <laughs> um, 
our, our German player, Timo, um, and he plays all formats. And then you defeated him. You got uh, revenge, I guess, in a way, or, or you avenged your loss versus Andrew in game right. five. I think yeah. that might have been the game I think I streamed live. Yeah, and then you def- And then you defeated Paul Todd Feldman, who's you know three or four-time world finalist, defending retro league champion, you know, 5-0. and oh. like he's Especially in these older formats, he's, he's really, really good. And uh, that game, I think, was that the one? I think I might have done that one. I think Dan did the other, the five and one versus six and zero, oh, um, with um, with Joe um, versus Adam. But yeah, so you you went through a gauntlet, and that um, the game versus Feldman, you, you played really well. So obviously, you played well in all these games. You, you won, but you know, how, how did you feel kind of going through it? Uh, well, so if we start back at the beginning, so, so uh, game one against Party McFly. So that one. I think that was the one I was luckiest to win. I, I felt like I was way behind. I think I was down 11 cards in my last pile to zero um, mm-hmm. at, you know, very early on in the game. So at the start, everything was going his way. He, uh, he countered or he won the sense alter war when I tried to sniper his undercover R2. Mm-hmm. And then he, he, um, quite a mercenary, my, my Vader. So I had <laughs> zero cards on board. He had an Obi Wan and an R two, and I was down eleven zero in the lost pile. But then after that, everything kind of, I you know turned around and, and started going my way. Um, had some battles in space. All my like he deployed the Tana four to the Death Star, and like I had nothing but space cards in my hand, so I was able to to counter that. Um, and like I got I got lucky. Honestly, um, there was one battle. Where I put a blizzard, blizzard one down and a pilot against his Obi Wan, and I ended up having like a reinforced differential, and mm-hmm. he decided to um, forfeit Obi Wan instead of losing three, three cards, mm-hmm. and I think that was a key um, change in in fortune from for me for mm-hmm. me, um, and essentially it took till turn twelve before we caught up in cards in the lost pile Mm -hmm. and by turn 14 um i was able to win so Mm -hmm. that that one kind of blew me away i was not expecting i thought for sure i I was out of it Mm -hmm. um, very early but i was able to pull that one off and from there round two against um gary and Mm -hmm. the sevist um that was that that wasn't as close of a, a game i think he made some questionable plays Honestly, uh, he deployed Mahdi alone out of sight, <laughs> and I was able to just, you know, deploy, battle him, and draw Destiny, get him to lose Mahdi. Um, there was one turn where he didn't stay forced to move his undercover spy, mm. so I was able to then kind of just move, maneuver around and always have that force drain open. Mm. And so at one was point, it he U3PO? Good old U3PO U- yeah. is always popping yeah. up in these games. Good old U3PO. And then, so. and then R3PO shows up sometimes. and So, uh, uh, so. Later on, he was MVP for me, uh, mm. and I think that game that we, the first game that we, that I streamed at, mm. uh, in round five. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But so, you know, against um, against the Sevist, uh, I kind of learned how good Mentillion Stabber could mm. be. Yeah. So, like, I had it in the deck, and against him, I was able to to play it. It stayed on the board, and you know, I never lost anything to any characters to to battle. I always mm-hmm. just lost from hand, right. and you know, that kind of set me up on uh, a strategy that I would employ later on. Um, yeah, it's pretty crazy. There was never a counter for that until special edition for for what is that? Probably two solid, you know, three solid years basically until. Uh, I mean, besides Alter, of course, but um, right. you get into those wars. But yeah, that's one thing I noticed in playing and, and streaming games in this, these older formats, is that there's a lot of ups and downs. And sometimes you're like, oh, this looks done, and it, it swings. And I, I think Open is a little less of that. Like, usually, by, on a, a lot of times, you know, not a lot, more often than back then, I think you kind of know who's going to win by turn five. Um, and the turns are all longer and meatier, but... Um, yeah. Yeah, it's good that you kind of have some some leeway. You have some um, what room for error, forgiveness. I'll say like 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 a golf yes. golf club, <laughs> so to speak. Um, that you you can kind of go up and down in the game and battles and move around. And there's 
yeah, there's not the shields kind of like, you know, sense altars, not secret plans. There's, you know, so the retrieval's a little easier to come by. Um, all that, all that fun stuff. So, okay. All right. So then after Gary, you played Will. Yeah. Um, so, so against Will, um, it, it was, I think th- it was this game where I felt like I was really coming into my own and, you know, understanding the format and understanding the decks. I felt like, you know, I, I employed a strategy. So in, in that game, he wasn't able to deploy a character to a site because all the sites on table were my my mm. fixes, my two O's. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he needed a spy. And early on, I Grimtosh two probe droids away. So, you know, he wasn't able to really put any characters down at sites. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kind of used Revolution to bait him to deploy U3PO to Yavin War Room. Okay. Um, and there was no place for him to move or move away from. So once he did that, um, I altered the revolution uh, and threw R3PO down there. And so for mm-hmm. that entire game, he was losing two force. Okay. Um, I'm surprised there's not more restraining. Like, I think I saw one or two restraining bolts, right? Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. So but... he might have got restraining bolt down very late. I don't know if it was against Will or if it was later on against mm-hmm. another, against Andrew, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know. One opponent eventually got a restraining bolt, but yeah, R three PO had done his work by then. So yeah, restraining bolt's crazy because even like to this day, there's no hard counter to that. The only thing you could do is put your droid in space because they can't deploy it there. Um, but or, I mean, I think a caller, <laughs> I think caller, but no one ever plays that card. Um, yes. But yeah, okay, all right. Um, and then so I was with light, well, obviously light side because you're playing with U three PO or R three PO. Yeah. And then you played against Timo, so you're both three and zero at this point. Um, played against, I mean, you really hit all the different time zones. You got, you know, Gary's yeah. in, in New Zealand, Will Central, Timo's yeah, in Germany. Everyone is very accommodating <laughs> to, uh, you know, the times and, mm-hmm. and, you know, arranging a game was never difficult. So mm-hmm. that was a good thing. Yeah, and that's where you know some people when they first hear about with the league of scheduling games, and we do this for like open leagues. Um, and for like match play events, sometimes online match play events, like it sounds like a bunch, but I think what's pretty cool is that people are getting in the rhythm of it. People are, you know, playing people for second, third time, you know, across now we're at, you know, six, seven events we're coming up on. Um, so people are just getting more of the flow of it. And yeah, I, I haven't really had any issues scheduling games and um, Steve does a great job uh, managing the league, Steve Sanders. So shout out to Steve. Um, so yeah, so then, yeah, so Timo in Germany, um, you played so, against him as dark side. Yeah, so I was dark, um, and things I remember from that is getting an early image of the Dark Lord down at the hollow table. So mm-hmm. I think I force-trained him for a total of seven um, with that just that one one card. I mm-hmm. um, also remember playing Monarch against him lost, and he had three altars in hand, and a you know, you get to see what else he has in his yeah, head. And that information. That's when, yeah, that's that's the moment where I, I learned just how powerful it is to be able to know what, what cards are in your opponent's hand. Mm-hmm. And I would use that, you know, a little later on um, in a key moment mm-hmm. in, the, in the next round. But, yeah, scanning crew, Monarch, knowing what's in their hand, being able to either play around it or whatever um, is definitely something to use to your advantage. Yeah, one thing you touched on before, too, about locations, about, like, you weren't putting out, all your locations were, like, Twixes, basically, two O's for you, and I think when people are first getting started, they're like, oh, I play locations because I need to get activation, so as soon as I draw (laughs) a location, just throw it on the table, but then if you're giving your opponent icons, like, those are huge, especially early in the game, and then they come into play, like you're saying, like, that came in that he couldn't move away anywhere, so you don't want to put, like, related sites down in certain cases, so... And that's right. where, you know, as you get to later sets like Battle Order and Battle Plan, like, it doesn't necessarily always make sense. You know, I think with open players, they use it as a shield, but it doesn't always make sense for you to pull it. And then same thing with, like, you know, Death Star 2 format, or I guess it came out in Endor. You know, it might make sense to hold on to it for a turn or two, um, that type of thing. So, yeah, it's kind of like those, like, default assumptions that sometimes people have to kind of adapt for. And that's, yeah, that was cool to see, or cool to hear about you kind of um, 
understanding. I mean, I, I like to think this, or a lot of people have said it, but there's a lot of like economics involved in, in Star Wars CCG of just like, you know, resources and limited. And, you know, sometimes you can't be too conservative because then you're letting your opponent find all their counters and draw up and activate a bunch. And so that's where there's always kind of like a, a timer going of each turn and letting your opponent you know, build up all their stuff. So it's good to put pressure on. I saw, uh, there was some, we got tagged and someone had, a like a tweet thread about how force training is really, was did not like force training. <laughs> and I was like, I think like without force training, I think this, and I think it's what Jerry Darcy talked about in one of his interviews yeah. with Kendall, like forces action. <laughs> like, or you, this game was just strictly battle, battle, battle. Like people, it, it would, it'd be, I don't know how the games would end. Like, cause people would just play super conservative. Um, it would, it would be pro pretty wild. Um, question in the chat. What's set legal up to? So there's actually, there's five events, and they kind of evolve. So the first was Premier to Hoth, and then there was a couple premium sets that were used. Like the two-player games were in there, the Rebel Leader Pack. Premier to Endor will include, like, EPP, Enhanced Premier Packs. And um, I'm trying to think what else. Well, uh, Official Tournament Sealed Deck was out at that point, I think. So it just kind of layers on. And it's a pretty cool format. And shout-out to Batmouse, because he was kind of doing these... Um, the, the sheriff of Jemp doing these a little while ago, like these medley leagues. They were kind of like a travel through time and a travel back in time. And that kind of was like the groundwork of this. And I think there's a book club too on Discord. I don't know if you're involved with that, but they kind of do all these like different formats as well. And they kind of do like a tour through time of like building up from each set, which I think Andy Talaga was talking today about how like it gets pretty ugly in like Premier to Dagobah, Premier to Cloud City. Like those are tough to stomach. <laughs> there's just a lot of like NPE in those formats. Um, yeah. But I, I think Premier to Hoth was a, a pretty good spot, um, even though it was, and it, was, it was good in that card pool wasn't too um, too expansive at that point. Yeah, the, the thing with Premier to Hoth is, like, a lot of the decks felt the same. Like I, So there wasn't a lot of variety, which was good for me, so I didn't have to mm -hmm. know, you know, 10 different decks that I might be facing. I mean, most of the decks had... If it was a dark side deck, it had Vader and Tarkin. If it was mm -hmm. a light side deck, it had Obi Wan and Luke. So yeah. they played very similarly. So that I also used that to my advantage. So I kind of knew what I was facing week after week. Um, yeah. And some of these further, you know, leagues that you know premier through Endor, premier through um, Death Star Two, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot more variety in decks that you'll face. So it's definitely a little harder to to learn the ins and outs of of everything. But for mm -hmm. for premier through Hawk, it was. It was fairly easy. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, and then, all right, so you defeated Teemo. I don't know if you wanted to say anything else about that matchup, but then you played Light Side versus Andrew, and I think both your last two games were streamed live. Right, um, yeah, so both were streamed. So uh, against Andrew, you know, that was not really a rematch, but felt like a rematch for me because <laughs> he had beat me in the, the Premier Through Reflections 2 Retro League event previously yeah, the de facto um, final confrontation that game yeah yeah so it was great to to be able to to play him again um similarly uh i had an early revolution against him so all the sites were 2-0 sites for me in my mm -hmm. favor so he couldn't deploy characters to sites at the beginning mm -hmm. um again used mentillion sabret basically to full effect so at this point i i knew the power of the card and as long as I could keep it in play, I felt pretty safe. Um, he did alter them once or twice to get rid of them, but by then, you know, the game was just kind of in, in hand for me. I think there was one key decision in this that, that he did. Um, we were basically locked at Kashyyyk. Um, he had Vader and Tarkin in a, on a Victory Class Star Destroyer, and I had reinforcements. Like, I had a lot of spaceships, and... Mm -hmm. Corvettes and, and whatever. So, but he was eventually going to out attrition me if he would have stuck to that plan. But instead, he deployed Kessel. And so now I had a place to run mm -hmm. to. I had another place to deploy to. So I deployed Gold Leader and Gold One there and was able to force train him there for three for a few turns. Mm -hmm. And then by the time he was, you know, attritioning me out at Kashyyyk, I was able to just kind of run away. Um, so that really gave me. The opportunity to to do more damage to him and you know uh outlive the attrition that i would have faced against vader and tarkin yeah so. yeah right well, he had vader and tarkin in space right the whole time yeah yeah because he couldn't have deployed on, on right. the ground yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no. um 
Yeah. But, um, and that's that. That's also the game where eventually he was able to deploy on on Hoth, and we had, uh, or he had U three PO out. I had R three PO out. Mm-hmm. He initiated the battle. I chose not to draw battle destiny so that he couldn't forfeit U three PO. Yeah. So he was losing. I remember to, that. Yeah, losing to a turn to to yeah. that. So yeah. that that game, I think I won by just eking out every little incremental advantage that I could find. And mm-hmm. and that's kind of what it took to beat him. So mm-hmm. that was a, a very close game and was able to, to pull it mm-hmm. off. Yeah, and then just a quick plug if anyone wants to watch the replays, but there's a the, the PC YouTube channel, so it's just Star Wars CCG, you can search, or youtube.com slash C as in uh, cat slash Star Wars CCG. And there's like a whole playlist for Decipher Era competitive stream, as we call it. Um, so it has has these. So check check those out for for John's games um, in the recent event. And there's lots of other ones as well, um, and that's one thing that you know, Steve and Andy and myself are really going to try to make sure we're covering all these top table games, these game fives and sixes. Because um, I mean, you know, you know, you know, no no events, but I think a lot of people when they come back to the game, they want to know, all right, what are the good decks? What are the good cards? What should I play? What are good players doing? Okay, what can I model my decks after? And if you're if we're kind of doing you know, game one or two and just kind of picking random stuff, you know, there is a chance sometimes there's some lopsided matchups then. But um, the other thing is later in the event too, you don't, you don't, people don't have to worry about, especially when the card pool is much more limited. Like once you play game five with your light deck, like you're not going to play that deck again. So it's not as big of a deal for us to cover and zoom in and seeing all the secret stuff and seeing how many limited resources are in the dark deck, (laughs) that type of stuff. Um, And then we just change the format, you know, a couple, a couple sets forward. So that's where it's kind of, is fair it gives um you know the players in the events coverage and a spotlight um and then but at the same time not not being unfair to them and leaking out all the secret tech um so all right so then game six then you played paul todd feldman um and that again was also streamed um and that that was really impressive i remember thinking during that game i was like who is this guy? <laughs> like, you got to get a get a uh, get a story on you because um, I know some of the retro players. Some, you know, they're, they're very active. You see them a lot, and you you just came back like less than a year now, basically, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so that's awesome. So, going into the match against um, Paul, um, like, um, how'd you feel about that? How'd, how'd that play out in your according to your plan? Uh, it, it played out perfectly. So <laughs> I had a probably the best opening hand I probably mm-hmm. ever had mm-hmm. in my life. I had Darth Vader, Grand Moff Tarkin, Garendon, you know, I don't know, probably a Death Star location. I'm not, mm-hmm. not exactly sure. So typically in Premier through Hoth, the first couple turns are spent just drawing whatever card you have so that mm-hmm. you can find your locations and, and get additional force uh, activations later on. But I mean, I had, I had such a great hand. I wasn't, I didn't draw uh, any cards the first couple turns and uh, basically set up to deploy Garindan, Vader, and right. Tarkin. And he ended up peeling a lot, if I remember right. He peeled a lot to keep Obi Wan on the table. He, he did. Um, well, you may be thinking of Andrew. So Andrew okay. actually was it Andrew? Uh, I don't want to get that wrong. I think it was um, Dylan or Timo. So he, he, one battle against him, he he peeled eleven off the top to keep. Uh, Obi Wan Vader or Obi Wan alive, okay. which I thought was a little questionable because at that point I felt like I was so far ahead I could just you know be conservative and just outrace him with with mm-hmm. the four strength that I had. But um, I remember there was a couple times I think you drew like a six and he drew a zero in one battle, right? That was the yeah. game. Yeah, so I, Paul. I did get lucky. I drew a six three times that that game, um, mm-hmm. and. One of the notes, so I, I also take notes after every game to try to reflect on, nice. on what I did and, and what I could do better. So I drew six naturally three times against him, but I wasn't tracking it. So oh. I need to get better at tracking destiny so that I know that, that I was going to get that six. But, I mean, it, hmm. I, I was super lucky with that, and it worked out. But Yeah, tracking in, in these old, the oldest formats is tough i mean later game it's a little easier but early in the game you, it's really tough you got to count like two three turns out maybe even more yeah. um yeah. but yeah it, it can be a diff- big differentiator late game um yeah now that, that was really well played i remember um and then yeah i mean 
you know, what, what I, I never always, always botched the saying, but like what success is when like preparation meets, I don't want to say luck, but <laughs> I should know the phrase, but like combination of, or what is it? Luck favors the well-prepared, that type of thing. So you're well-prepared, you're getting your reps in. Right. And then that's awesome that you got a grid hand. And Paul's someone who I think says that a lot of like nice hand or nice draw. Um, and I think yeah. he means it well, but um, I, yeah, I mean, sometimes I think I'm a little skeptical of that phrase because I think it's, uh, you know, sometimes it's just good deck construction. And then, yeah, you know, hopefully every few games you do get a real, really good hand. Um, and then, yeah, the extremes, 10% of the time you're gonna get an amazing hand, 10% of the time you're gonna get a really bad hand and um, that type of thing. But but yeah, no, it's it's really, really neat to see your growth coming back to the game, kind of picking up with, you know, you had success back in the day. Um, and then three, three and three, three and three, five and one, six and zero. Oh, like that, that's a great, great yeah. trend, and and that's awesome to see growth. And that's where I think you're really inspirational to a lot of people come back to the game, and they just say, "Wow, how am I gonna?" There's so much to d- digest. This is such a complex game. Even these retro formats, some of them are. Some people are really intimidated, and and you know, you get your reps in, you practice, you di- watch some streams, digest some stuff. It's not impossible, and there's enough randomness in the game that. Um, you know, with draws, with, with your hands, what you draw, with destinies that you draw, that I think anything can happen. And, um, and you know, this is awesome to kind of see you kind of consolidate what, what you've learned and now d- doing really well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, it's more than I could have hoped for. Um, I'm just happy that there's, you know, a, you know it, it's a retro league, so it is competitive, but it's not like hardcore competitive. I mm-hmm. mean, yeah, it's a good mix. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's so it was a perfect thing for me to, to get back into it, um, you know, and it's kind of inspired me to go to the the U.S. Nationals here in a couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. I, again, I'm more just to meet people and um, play in the Friday Night Retro event, but mm-hmm. you know, I'm looking forward to it. So yeah, and that's where like Swiss format's kind of cool too, because if you're, yeah, you know, if it, not not you in this case, but maybe you in the open <laughs> in the open yeah. event like you don't have to keep playing really 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 good and well performing players in game four five six you're kind of yeah. matched up gradually with how different people are performing so and and the cool thing too is you know the, the it's not quite as cutthroat you know at you know and the the bottom third of the tables by game seven so people will give you pointers and know what you know why'd you do you, i wouldn't do that or they'll let you take back a shield or offer hey you want battle plan here that type of stuff i think pops up a little more uh, which is good, but um, yeah, we'll happen. We'll talk on that a little bit more. Which I'm really now that I'm thinking about this, I really want to hear about your approach to decks for for an open event for the very first time. But um, yeah, so we wrapped up um, event one. I wanted to ask, well, what was like your favorite era? Was it the Premier to Death Star two? Would you say? Yeah, okay. pretty much Premier through Death Star two because that's. I mean that that was the full amount of card pool that that I played with. Mm-hmm. Um, Reflections two. I wasn't really fully into it during Reflections 2 era. Mm-hmm. Um, so Premiere through Death Star 2, love that. Um, probably my favorite set. It wasn't maybe the most powerful set, but I, I loved Jabba's Palace. I loved all the aliens mm-hmm. I loved. So it's kind of funny. So back in back then, you know, all the lore and and all the things that the Cypher did really enhanced my love of Star Wars mm-hmm. and the game. And so... Um, like learning about all the different aliens and watching the movie and seeing, you know, oh, th- there's an alien that you never noticed right, before. Right. I think, yeah. yeah, so that was cool. Today, um, like, I play Magic the Gathering or whatever, mm. and I don't care about the artwork. I don't care about the, the lore. It's like that that part of the card doesn't exist. But in mm. those days of Star Wars, learning about all the characters and stuff, that was, you know, a lot of the enjoyment of the game yeah. for me. Yeah, it's all, and Star Wars CCG created a lot of lore. I know that was such a thing that appealed to collectors. Um, mm-hmm. Just the look of the cards was awesome. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, with you know, with a lot of virtual cards, we you know, we can't really create. We yeah. I shouldn't say we can't really. We can't create lore because it would be pretty neat to have that type of angle. Um, we just kind of have like facts, like leader and <laughs> um, yeah. you know any type of species that type of stuff. But um, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Between Jabba's palace. In Return of the Jedi and the Cantina, you know those those opening scenes alone were probably so many cards, so many characters. Um, so okay, all right, cool. So favorite format. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the outlook. So we have Premiere to Endor going on right now, which 
I think Andy was saying that it's kind of an interesting place where it's it's kind of in between some of the NPE from the early Decipher days, and they're having like Death Star Two was awesome because it had a lot of you know constraints like um, you know the the anti numbers cards and um, mobilization points really sped up everything, which some people think is bad, but um, I think numbers are still pretty viable. Not with undercover spies, I think thankfully because <laughs> the rule was changed. I think at some point um, they don't count towards numbers, but um, and we have a couple objectives we can play with now. So I guess, how are you feeling feeling about this this event? <laughs> Again, uh, my expectations aren't aren't high. Um, so now we start to have, like you said, more deck choices, um, and you know, I, I have no experience really with the, the format. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of spoiler alert, sticking to decks that I, that I know and just mm -hmm. kind of tweaking them for. Premier through indoor format. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if they're going to be any good, but you know it's what I know and it's what I'm going to stick with, uh, at least to kick things off. Um, yeah. So I, yeah, I mean Andy had that um, recent video where he talked about the different decks and mm -hmm. and and whatnot for this format. So thank you, Andy. That mm -hmm. definitely help, it's yeah. helpful. So if you haven't checked it out, check out Andy's mm -hmm. breakdown. Yeah, we promoted that, I think, a little bit on the... I'm sure he did, too, on, on Discord, um, Facebook channel. But, yeah, it's... it's uh, and One thing, like, last year, like I, even though I was basically running the league with Steve, I didn't participate in the first two events because I just thought they were too far back. And then this year, I was like, you know what? You know, let me just play. I, I can I grab some sample decks effectively, and, and Adam is... EBT has done a good job of getting sample decks in there, so you have a base, and we're trying to build up more of a repository now, but... There was uh, Steve Skilton had a couple posted on the forum. That's what I use for Mirror to Ha. So I'm basically like, let me grab a template. Maybe I'll tweak, you know, five six cards and just play. And you know, I don't have to stress too much about it. I think it's a nice. I don't think it's it's not cutthroat, um, but it is kind of semi competitive, and there are incentives for everyone to, to do well. So I think it's a nice mix. Um, that's kind of my approach to the Premier to Endor too. Like I don't have any super duper refined deck list, um, but looking forward to just playing and kind of experiencing something. A little bit different, and uh, there's, there's, there's some benefits. I think in some respects the game goes faster, and there's less, you know, balls in the air to juggle. Where you're trying to always be sure what shields are on the table, what effects are on the table, what modifiers are, you know, being applied. Like all those types of things, where the game just gets more complex, and in good ways, but also sometimes in <laughs> stressful ways. So, um, so yeah, I think it'll be fun. And then Premier to Death Star Two is next, and Premier to Jabba's Palace Seal Deck, which I I really like both of those because. Um, I think they're familiar. They're very well played, on, or often played, I should say, on Gent by everybody. All the Bratcher players seem to love those formats the most. And then, yeah, then the um, the the basically like a Jawa format um, for the Premier Reflections too. That'll be interesting um, at the end of the year. Yes. So more looking forward to Premier through Death Star Two and Premier through Refle Reflections Two because that's mm -hmm. more what I remember. Um, like you said, Premier through Endor. Um, you know, my expectations aren't high, but I'm there to have fun and, mm -hmm. and hopefully do well. But, you know, I'm not, not worried if, uh, if things go bo poorly. So, yeah, it's, this game, it, it's easy to kind of get caught up in like, oh, you know, these new cards that came out in the indoor set are going to change everything so much. But at the same time, like, you know, the fundamentals in a lot of ways are the same and it's, you, you kind of adjust on the fly. And that's where I think it's, it's it's there's still enough randomness involved and you know, like and andy was like some people you don't you can win games without playing those you know three or four tier one decks it's more difficult you might need some more luck um but you know, not not you specifically just in general i'm saying um <laughs> but uh yeah it can happen there's there's enough fair and someone gets a bad they draw a bad hand and, and then before you know it like the kind of the hodgepodge deck might do well against more of kind of some fine-tuned props deck not not likely right. but possible um all right cool um all right so let's talk I, i'm really curious about your approach to attending that i think it's awesome first of all it, it's great you're gonna have an awesome time um i think the retro event's gonna be really neat it's gonna be going on along with the cube event on friday night um today was the last day for pre-registration if anyone hasn't already pre-registered or if you're within driving distance you could still register and play you don't have to pre-register um if you're watching this if you're within you know, a couple hour radius of Minneapolis. Um, you're watching this, go, go, go hang out. You don't even have to play, but if you want to play, that's awesome. But if you just want to 
hang out with everybody, kind of the, the core um, players of the uh, community, I would say, um, who, who travel these events and I've been doing so for so, so much time. You're going you're gonna to have an awesome time, but um, I'm curious to your approach. Like, how are you going to build decks? Um, like, have you been doing a sh reading a shield primer? Like, talk, talk to me about your approach towards Saturday. <laughs> So for, for Saturday, so I'm, I'm going, you know, kind of a spoiler alert. So um, I'm, I'm sticking to the two decks that I know, which are Hunt Down and Hidden Base. So I just looked at the <laughs> recent uh, open events. I think mm -hmm. San Diego had, had one um, Hunt Down list and one Hidden Base deck. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, printed those up. I, Actually, was at Office Depot last night, oh, cutting nice. them out, cutting out the, the sleeves. Mm -hmm. So that it's a little bit of work. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. The wasn't expecting how much work. That yeah, is. the first few times. Yeah, are you double sleeving or just doing one? Double sleeving. Oh wow. So so question: Do you put your slips inside the inner sleeve or do you put them outside the inner sleeve? Inside the inner. So I, I do the inner, and I do it upside down. So I go up, yeah. and then the slip. And then the other Perfect. sleeve is the other way. And then there's yep. going to be air, so you got to kind of compress yep. the air out of there uh, a few yep. times. All right, so I'm doing it the, the, the same way, so so good to know. Um, still waiting on some cars I just ordered from Brian Fred's website. Uh, hopefully they'll be here uh, so that I can nice. you know, have nice. a full deck. Otherwise, yeah. I'll have to go with something else. But um, So that that's my approach, basically. I, I found a hidden base deck and a hunt down deck. I love mm -hmm. playing those, so... Yeah, not not to throw a monkey wrench, but just something to consider. I'm not sure exactly what the hidden base deck was played. I mean, there's a couple of variations. There's the you know, the freighters with the quads, but the one that Johnny Chu, who you're probably familiar with, he played hidden base at Worlds with like the weather vane deck, and and that thing. I think that deck's really good. I mean, it's a, it's a little niche in some ways, but like it was played a little bit in the Champions League. Um, okay, I think if you. There's some at, there's some matchups like I played like I played against it in the Gem PC. I was playing against my my good buddy Sean Luke's, this guy who actually got me into uh, Gem and who I used to play with back in the day. And I started playing Premier Death Star two only and playing Hunt Down because I was familiar with it. Um, and then gradually got played a lot of Hunt Down and Open. But he played it. I, I flipped. I was playing Hunt Down V, which is a little bit different. But I was like, wait a minute, this might be trouble. <laughs> like I don't have a ton of space in here. Um, so yeah, that hidden base is pretty good. And then uh, and yeah, Hunt Down. It's it's like. It's like riding a bike. You're familiar. You, you basically get Vader on the table and right. have some fun battles, and games go quick, which is good. So you're <laughs> either, either way, whether you win or lose, they're they're usually quick, so you can you won't have too much trouble grabbing a bite to eat in between some games, or they probably will do a lunch break um, of some sort. But uh, but yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, I was gonna say about yeah. All right, so you're getting some cards from B Fred. If, if you need to borrow anything, I'm sure people can help out. Um, okay. So don't don't feel like you're playing suboptimal cards. Um, just because you don't have them or can't get them or they're super expensive because that happens too. Um, yes. Yeah, and then, yeah, they usually do all types of games in, in the gaming room on Saturday night. Um, you know, uh, then Sunday's, they call it the Constellation event, uh, Sunday Swiss event. There's, you know, prizes for everything. Um, I'm actually prepping that as we speak. Um, prepping right. the little so, bags for everybody. So my expectations for Saturday is not to do well. My ex. <laughs> So I my, my flight is leaving Sunday. So okay. <laughs> so, so that that's my you know my thought process that I will be uh, not making it to day two and uh, will be enjoying my my flight home Sunday yeah. afternoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. So yeah, you'll have a good time then Friday night, Saturday night, and and both those events. Um, yeah, everyone's very friendly. Um, so yeah, you'll you'll have a great time. Um, cool. Looking and don't, forward to it. Don't feel bad. Um, yeah, there's there's gonna be, yeah, <laughs> you'll you'll do fine, especially with Hunt Down. Hunt Down's a good deck to pick um, for for just jumping into open. Cool. Um, okay, and then let's see. All right, so we talked about that. Yeah, I think um, you you're probably gonna be receiving in a day or two if you haven't gotten already the uncut sheet for winning event one. It's premiere or not premiere. It's a New Hope Uncommon Light Side, which is awesome. pretty cool. Right. So yeah. Um, there's not a lot of, you won't be tempted to cut it up and put it in decks. I'll tell you that much, but it does look cool. It's very thematic, you know, good old, uh, a new hope, um, you know, pictures, themes, lore. Um, so it'd be cool. Um, yeah, it's an awesome prize. Like I don't have an uncut sheet, so it'll be my first one and perfect prize for, for winning 
the first event. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, so I think that's about all I have. So congratulations again. Thanks for doing this. Have a great. You're gonna have a great time at nationals. Thanks for um, having me. Yeah, and uh, and yeah, I think that's about it. Thanks to the chat. We had a couple questions, so thanks for engaging. And um, you know, I'll, I'll try to put a couple th- things in the comments or the notes for the YouTube, any links and things that we talked about, just so people can. Hey, I want to check that out, so they can have a um, place to to start with and go and explore some of the stuff that we talked about. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, everyone. I'll end the stream now. Uh, May the force be with you, and take care. Thank you.